and welcome, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always, <laughs> I should say as always, is a returning good brother to the temple. Jeez, I'm fucking it up already. <laughs> Some of you may know him as the mastermind behind the 5e adaptation of Thrones and Bones. Now coming back to the fray with Vengeance of the Valrav. I'm hoping I pronounced that right. Probably didn't. A, a 5e adventure. The one and only Lou Anders. How are you doing today, man? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you. <laughs> and I think you pronounced it right. Valravin. Yeah, Val. Um, Valravin. Scandinavian languages are the bane of my existence. Yep. Uh, especially any Slavic language. Well, anytime I pronounce something wrong, I can just say that's how they pronounce it on Earth, but the game's not on Earth, so maybe they pronounce it differently there. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, could, it could be worse. You could be trying to pronounce Polish. <laughs> the hard mode of European languages. <laughs> For a minute, I thought you meant the word Polish, and I'm like, Why? How, is, how is that hard to pronounce? No. <laughs> but anyway, it's glad to be. I'm glad to be back. <laughs> so, as, as an as an aside, given the given the opening um, text on the Kickstarter for Vet for Ven Vengeance of the Valrav. Um, there is a there is a there is a missed opportunity to make a hungry like a hungry like the wolf joke. <laughs> maybe maybe I'm just maybe I'm just too I'm just too I'll, wired. I'll, I'll, I would I will keep missing that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> just just completely sandbag it. Yeah, yeah. It knocks. I'm not home. <laughs> yeah, fair fair enough. So, given given the last project I that I covered, I I do have I do have to ask, um, is is Vengeance of the Valrav meant to be a meant to be a companion to Thrones and Bones, or is it its own thing? No, it's it's in the Thrones and Bones. In fact, it it could slot in between two of the ventures in the Sagas of Norengard adventure book mm -hmm. quite easily. Now, I remember when I talked with you about Thrones and Bones, you mentioned that being technically an adaptation. Was with th with this project? Was this something that you ended up making on your own, or did or were you collaborating with the original author? Well, I am the original author. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Thrones and Bones was originally my my book series at Penguin Random House. Yeah. Um, so, you'll, have to, you'll have to excuse you'll have to excuse uh, my lapse in memory. It's been it's been fine. like what I, two years. You're correct. I was collaborating with the original author rather closely. Uh, <laughs> that that one's on me. It uh, it it years and years and years and years and years ago, I I studied theater in London, and I took a a course from uh, Dorothy Tooten, who used to be in uh, Harold Pinter's plays, and she taught us a course on Pinter. And at one point, we asked what Pinter meant by a certain line. And she said that, that they had asked him the same question when they were rehearsing, and he had responded, we can't possibly know the author's intention at this point. Like Pinter <laughs> directing his own play, saying, we can't, we can't possibly know what the author's intention was at this point. And, uh, I, you know, that's a little bit like what collaborating with yourself feels like. Um, I... but, it's, but, it's, but it's, you know, there was a lot of, the books are 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 mostly the the first book, which is uh, I got I got to back up. Mm -hmm. The first book takes place in the Norse inspired land of Norengard. The second and third book leave that land and travel about two thousand miles across my world. So the game so far has only dealt with the Norse portion of the world, uh, and and so when I did the game last year, it is. Uh, you know, a role-playing game needs to be so much more expansive than a book. The book only went to one city, 
and one farm and then the wilderness. And so the game, uh, we created nine more cities for it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's much, much broader. And also the books are children's books, although I wrote them to be all ages. I just heard three weeks ago from a fan who's 64. But uh, but the game is very much aimed at anybody who plays Dungeons and Dragons, mm-hmm. and uh, gets much darker than the books in places. Although it's yeah. also funny in places. Yeah. But this adventure is just a standalone seventh level adventure. Uh, it's going to end up being about sixty five to seventy pages, depending, maybe a little bit longer, and um, depending on whether or not we hit the next stretch goal, mm-hmm. and. And could, like I said, slot in in the Sagas of Norengard adventure book. It could go. Uh, we, we we say where it could be put placed if you run it as part of that campaign, or it could be dropped into any north northern flavored campaign you've got going. Mm-hmm. Now, whenever I examine adventures, and I'm I'm obviously going to try and avoid anything spoilery when it comes to the when it comes to the adventure as best as I can, but. No promises, obviously. Um, something that I try and I try and get into is what's is what sort of tone it's going for, since not all adventures are going to be just dungeon crawls. Yep. No, this is definitely um, it's an urban adventure. It takes place in the city of Sint Sintholm, mm-hmm. and uh, which is not featured in any of the other adventures we put out so far, and it really expands the city and the lore of the city. It's um, Tonally, it's pre- it's the darkest thing I've done. It uh, it wasn't supposed to be. I I the the genesis for this was that uh, a few years back I read an article that was floating around about how wolves had been reintroduced to an ecosystem. I don't think it was Yellowstone. I think it was somewhere else. Although they did this in Yellowstone too, but uh, it, but basically wolves had been hunted to extinction in a certain environment, then they reintroduce the wolves decades later, and the wolves have a positive cascading domino effect, and the whole ecosystem comes back. You know, the wolves cut down on the deer-elk population, the deer or the elk stop eating the plants, that stops erosion, that makes the river start teeming with fish again, that brings back birds, and suddenly the whole place is transformed in like a mm-hmm. five years. And I was feeling guilty for how many damn wolves I shot in Tomb Raider <laughs> or killed, you know, in Dungeons and Dragons or used as low level antagonists in books and games. And uh, so I thought I'd write something that was wolf positive. And uh, there's a monster in, you know, if it's going to be wolf positive, then I need an anti wolf. And there's a monster from. Um, not from Norse myth, but from later Scandinavian folklore called the Valravn. And when a chief, or in our case a Jarl, is killed in the woods and left unburied and a raven eats his heart, the raven transforms into a wolf-raven hybrid. Mm-hmm. And that hybrid creature can eat a child's heart. It can become humanoid. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, in in the original story from like the 1800s where they first appear it eats a child's heart and then it marries the girl of the story and they live happily ever after and it's kind of one of those weird things you know before before stories got morals <laughs> and, and, and points you know you read a lot of old medieval stuff and it's it's horrific and then she killed her mother-in-law and ate her and everyone lived happily ever after and um and but I added that the the, the change to humanoid only lasts ten days, and so they 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 have to be continually fed children's hearts or they lose their humanoid form, and that makes it a little more sinister. Um, and so suddenly I'm telling the darkest tale I've told so far in something that was supposed to be a happy wolf story. Well, to be to be fair, a, a lot of people have the have the assumption of fairy tales being the, being the being this um, happy thing. Some some could argue this is the Disney effect in motion. Yep. And then they read the original stories, and they are you they are usually horrified at how, at how dark it actually is. Meanwhile, I'm meanwhile I'm sitting back in the corner laughing. Well, you know, the, I mean, the original Brothers Grimm book was supposed to be a textbook. Mm-hmm. And when they found out people were using it as as a children's storybook, they actually did an edit on it to make it less horrific. 
and reissued it with with a little less of the gore. It's still gory, but they yeah. le- issued it with less gore. Yeah, but I suppose the, I suppose a good example of the, of this kind of thing in action is when somebody watches, say, The Hunchback of Notre Dame as a kid, and then as an adult reads the original story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a happy ending where everybody dies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I hated that adaptation. That's the worst thing they ever did. That is the. the I mean, I like a lot of Disney movies. That one was a tra- tragedy, travesty, but uh, a tragedy, travesty, a tragedy. Um, a tragedy. We'll go with that. <laughs> but you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how. Everybody has a different uh, idea of what dark is. I think if you got dead kids and something eating kids' hearts, it's pretty dark. But mm. maybe it's not. Um, but anyway, it has a happy ending, or it will if the players survive. Yeah. Now, taking that into account, since you mentioned it being a essentially an urban fantasy, I'm guessing a lot, a good chunk of the page count is dedicated to the not not in excessive detail, but just the details of um, the town of Sintholm. Um. Yes. It, it uh, you know, we, we got a beautiful map by Rob Lazaretti, and uh, Heroic Maps is doing the, the maps for the adventure again. And when they read the adventure, I had only asked them to detail one or two of the specific city locations, and they said, no, we're going to do them all. We're going to do them all. And so it's, I think we're going to end up with enough of a, uh, one of the things that's unusual about the city of Sinholm that I love is that I, I established early on in my world that each major city would have the Jarl's longhouse and then it would have the Gothi's temple. The Gothi was the Norse word for God man and it's like the priest. Mm-hmm. And we don't really know what their temples look like, but you can't really do Scandinavia without stave churches. I mean, you know, if you, I don't know if you watch the TV show Vikings, but when they went to the famous holy site in that show they decided to make it look like stave church and uh so each city in my location has a longhouse and a stave temple and except for sinholm and sinholm is unique in that the jarl in his backstory is uh set upon in the woods and prays to any god that will listen that i'll build a temple to you if you get me out of this and when he gets out of it he dedicates his life to the god, and he converts his longhouse into a stave temple. So it's an unusual construction that the ground floor is a longhouse, but then it has four more stories on top, making it you know tiered like a temple, like a stave church. And he is both the Jarl and Gothi of Sintom. And we're going to map out his entire temple longhouse, which I'm really excited about. And then... The reason I chose Sinholm is when I created this uh, game last year, I, I made three different barbarian paths. The path of the wolf, the path of the bear, and the path of the boar. And the path of the wolf was founded in Sinholm. And there's a backstory that I won't spoil, I don't think, but it's wolf-related, obviously, that took place 800 years prior that comes into play. And so the path of the wolf barbarians have their founding you know, clubhouse here called Dringler Halla, which means Hall of the Valiant Warriors. And we're going to map Dringler Halla out. And if it gets, if we hit our next stretch goal, then I'm going to detail it in really deep detail and uh, add three or four pages to the book on, on lore. So I think this could serve as a really good just setting guide if you want a place that has, you know, a number of locations mapped out, a lot of streets and markets mapped out, a lot of lore. A huge city map, uh, a backstory that goes back eight hundred years. It, it, it you know it would be after this adventure. This is this is a good place to set out from adventures from mm-hmm. to make a home base for the characters. Mm-hmm. And given that, given that, um, now I'm not once again I'm not asking you to spoil because I wouldn't want anybody to spoil my own stories. Um, do you have do you have a plan to put in se- put in sections for how you could take the adventure afterwards if you do take if you do take that approach of it being kind of a home base for the party? There's kind of a uh, not a two be the adventure ends, 
But in the course of the adventure, you have the opportunity to get help from somebody. And if that particular somebody lends you aid, then you owe them a favor. And they're not necessarily the kind of somebody you want to owe a favor to. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, an after credit sequence, I guess, where, where they can call on that. They, they tell you they're going to call on that favor. Mm -hmm. And so you could springboard that into another adventure pretty easily. Yeah. And I, I might might do that adventure at some point too because I'm really interested in it. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes when it comes to doing a a camp any sort of campaign where you're going to have a large amount of pe of people within it, usually you're going to have some some people who are the movers and shakers beyond just whoever's running the place. Yep. Do you have a few? Do you have a few cases of that with um, Vengeance of the Valrav? And yep. are there any um, prominent NPCs you can tell me about? Yeah. So um, the the after the Jarl, and then you've got the Jarl's house carls and the, his head house carl. Then you also have the head of the of the Path of the Wolf Barbarians in Dringer Halla, and the head's right hand man. And um, and then there are a couple other named characters in it as well as as uh, some. All, all the people in the markets, but the the head of the of you know ordinarily the cities would have the jarl and the gothi, and those would be the two important people in the city. In this case, it's the since the jarl is the gothi, the head of the path of the wolf barbarian sort of serves as the second power in the city. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the wolf barbarians, mm -hmm. uh obviously just obviously just by the name they're not, they are they're going to be on the outs on the outskirts of the city but what can you tell me about them as a group compared to uh, the compared to the rest of the city and how they're generally seen they are sort of a band of heroes um i created uh, an npc a generic npc stat block for them and then the, the two heads have their own unique stat blocks. And in fact, we, 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 um, we, the two of the pledge levels were to be those two characters. And, uh, one of the guys that pledged, who pledged for the leader of the Path of the Wolf Barbarians, had previously pledged to be one of the Raven Guard, the elite warriors of Corrigan Guard in the previous Kickstarter. And I'm like, okay, am I supposed to work for the same photograph? <laughs> because <laughs> so it turns out that the surprise, surprise, the leader of the Path of Wolf Barbarians is the younger twin brother of the guy in the Raven Guard. And that's um kind of fun. I like the way that lore like that evolves beyond my, you know, stay. Mm -hmm. Now with that with that in mind. Even though this is a or is this is an urban campaign, do you plan do you plan on having some segment that leans into investigation? Yes, you have to leave early on. You leave the city and go to a village called Skegthorpe on the outskirts on the outskirts outskirts, and uh, then you there's some woods at night exploration around Skegthorpe, mm -hmm. and there's also. Um, Sindholm is is also unique in that it's built on a series of plateaus, and there's a there's an there's a there's a the city itself is raised above the water level off on cliffs, and then and and instead of having a regular harbor, there's an underground ca cavernous harbor, and then you take steps up to the city, and then the city is built on three plateaus with the Jarl's Longhouse on the top one, mm -hmm. and tunneled into the plateaus, they've built uh, the uh, or where they bury their dead. And so you can imagine that maybe, just maybe, <laughs> we have to go into those tunnels too at some point. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's plenty. There's plenty of bad things to be to be found underground, just as there are overground. Oh yes. Oh. Now you had specifically said it that this is a seventh level adventure. Yeah. Oh. First, what made you go with seventh level as the as the level is it just because of where it fits in when it comes to the uh, yeah, we, of thrones we, and bones or was that a different reason no it's uh it's, it's a couple reasons and one is that that, that, that i had used the Valraven raven monster 
in the Sagas of Norgard book, uh, Sarah Madsen uh, of Cobalt Press fame mm. wrote an adventure called uh, 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 Matters of the Heart with Val Robin. And so I didn't want to spoil her adventure for anybody who's playing both. So I knew it had to follow her adventure. And things kind of heat up after that. And also, uh, her adventure is short. And I, if somebody, you know, I like milestone leveling, but if you're using experience-based leveling, you might feel like that wasn't enough to get you to eighth level. Mm -hmm. so slotting this one in right after it made a lot of sense. And also, we're not dealing with a regular Vol Robin in this. I've, I've, uh, I've created a third category of the monster that comes into play. And, uh, and so it made sense to, to follow up her adventure with something that takes it in a different direction. Yeah. And then finally, I'm running my own players through this, and they're going to come up on 7th level soon. So, I, I hope you haven't had any TPK incidents in running this with your own players. Not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. And just to make you know, sure I don't jinx it. Yeah, yeah. It's always... Um, you know the TP, the best the best TPK instances are almost TPK instances where they get down to that last player who's still standing and then somehow it turns around. Mm -hmm. So the other th the other thing I I was curious about is when it is um sometimes 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 I've had the unfortunate well fortune of have of having adventures that speci that um specifically lean towards certain skill sets or the like because um because sometimes a the writer of said adventure and I'm not naming names um uh, had written the adventure with a, with a certain party set in mind mm -hmm. have in this case have you have you made have you taken steps to make sure that d that doesn't happen or the or mm -hmm. or the adventure doesn't end up um grinding if if somebody doesn't have the right skill proficiencies, right? Could could a group of five bards play this? Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah, this there's something I really don't want to spoil. You know, you, you never know how much to tease because you want people to get interested, but you also don't want um, to spoil something. And uh, there's a certain point in this adventure that throws everybody, no matter who you are, for a loop. And uh, it's it it really I, I think it was probably a great leveling moment. Yeah. Uh, not leveling in the context we usually use it in RPGs. Leveling is in flattening and resetting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it really doesn't matter who you go in as. Something happens about midway. You'll and, and it uh, knocks all the pins over, so to speak. Yeah. Because I can. I mean, I. It would be. This is not it. Mm -hmm. All right, this is not it. But like, imagine if halfway through a story, you all died and found yourself in hell, and you were given a new skill set while you were there, and then you had to get out of hell. You know, um, that's not it. But something along those lines. <laughs> yeah. I can something. I can, yeah, I can certainly get behind that. Yeah. Um. Now, when it comes to when it comes to some of these stretch goals that were that were mentioned, including the one with um with magic items, you mentioned adding three more magic items. I yeah. I doubt that this is going to go full Monty Hall, but I get the feeling there's a handful of magic items that you'll be that are going to be highlighted within it. Would it be too much of a spoiler to ask for what you have planned when it comes to that? No, um, it, it not at all, and it's it, it's um. It's it's uh, and, and what I want to say, I, I kept the stretch goals in this one deliberately light. Uh, I mean, this is supposed to be a small Kickstarter between big Kickstarters. You know, the last Kickstarter was big. The next Kickstarter is going to be um, for a a short fiction anthology uh, by other writers set in the world, and there the stories are all written. And I'll bring that out. I hope to do that in the first quarter next year. And so I don't want this Kickstarter getting too big because Kickstarter won't let me do, you know, I can't have overlapping Kickstarters. And I really want to launch the next one in February or March. So so I wanted to keep this one as a, as a you know, originally I thought this was just going to be a 30-page soft cover adventure. It's turning into a 70-page hardcover adventure. But, uh, but either way, 
and I, and it's it's a pretty meaty adventure actually, but I I I can't seem to keep things small. But um but I want this one to be the in between thing. I don't want this to spiral out of control. So like an obvious stretch goal would be to double the size of the book, but if I double the size of the book, then it's going to it's not going to it's still going to be in fulfillment when I want to launch my next one. Yeah. Um so magic items is a fun way to just give people some cool things and extend the setting without without um throwing off my timetables. Um I'm trying we've got um one of the magic items is a sword and I am collaborating with a buddy now on a kind of sword leveling up system. And that's not in this, but I'm kind of building this with an idea that it could be it could be carried into that when we get there. And then um when you say sword leveling up, are you talking about a a a sword in this case that would get that would get more features as you increase in level or yes 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 so that's that's but i won't talk too much about that because that's not that's not this i'm i'm hoping this will the, the what i that the, the the stored stuff we're working on will be ready to go into the next kickstarter but um but i'm kind of building this sword with the idea in mind that it could turn into that sword um and then i'm just trying to come up with fun stuff i i i, I uh Boots of the Mountain Goat, the Shipwright's Hammer, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, I kind I'm trying to come up with Norse flavored items. I, I I've I've um, gone ahead and commissioned the artwork for the additional magic items. One of them is is a mead horn with unusual effects. Like it'll cure a lot of hit points, but it'll also get you drunk. Mm -hmm. So. How hungover do you want to be? <laughs> um, about as hungover as my co as my co-hosts are whenever whenever they show up right. late. But I mean, you could see that like being some real comedy You're in the middle of a battle. You really need hit points. You don't have anything else available. You drink the meat horn. It does you know forty four, and that's great. But then you're 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 drunk. Now everything is a disadvantage because you can't stand up. Yeah, I, mean, I I can I can see that because I'd imagine I'd imagine that that um even even in this kind of thing some sort of feasting is go is going to happen. Oh yeah, <laughs> always. Yeah. Now, I know that you had I know that you had said that it's gonna be it's gonna be around sixty pages. Even with the stretch goals, do you see it expanding beyond that? Um. I, I think that it'll get I think seventy is about where it'll end up. Um it just depends on, on if we hit the drink of holler stretch goal how much I want to write about it. But I think seventy pages is about where it'll end up. Mm hmm I I can certainly see that. Yeah. And I you know the the, the, the um actually I need to I need to revise that because the I've laid the book out already. Um based on my expectation of the number of maps we're going to have. And then, I, as I said, heroic maps told me they're going to do maps for everything. So actually, it could jump to closer to 80 pages, depending on how the maps fit into the book. Mm -hmm. So it might be a, it might get bigger just, just because we need extra space for their gorgeous maps. <laughs> and they're doing night and day versions of a lot of the maps, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, the replayability. Like, maybe this particular thing takes place at night, but then... Will have the daytime version for when you're just there for whatever reason in another adventure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, with that in mind, uh, I know. I, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? I know you. I know the art is a bit is a bit of a wait. Nope, all the art's in except for the maps, and the maps will be in by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. um, I'm. I, I deliberately push I, the the I think the deadline I put on the Kickstarter is like June twenty twenty three, mm -hmm. but I actually I mean, you know, uh, I'd rather promise late and surprise people than promise early and disappoint people. So the official release date will be next summer, but I'm hoping I can have it out in February. 
Yeah, I can I can certainly get behind that. Yeah. Uh, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way back up to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. My pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Wonderful. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>